Scott Winship is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and frequent writer for Forbes and other publications. He focuses on income inequality and economic mobility and worked with Congressman Paul Ryan on his anti-poverty agenda. Winship recently proposed his own conservative opportunity agenda, which we'd like to hear more about. So thanks for joining us. Right now, there's a big conversation about income inequality. And one of the things you say is, is that's almost a distraction compared mm. to where we should be focusing on opportunity and mobility. Explain that. I think that's exactly right. I, I think a lot of people, when they talk about inequality of opportunity, which is something I'm very concerned about, and I think a lot of conservatives are, are concerned about, they automatically go to income inequality. If inequality in the United States had grown and the rich had got richer and the poor had got poorer, that's sort of one thing to worry about. But if it's, if it's more the case that the rich have gotten rich, uh, and, and the poor are also better off, not nearly uh, to the same extent, but the poor are uh, quite a bit better off uh, in terms of how much income they have uh, than 30 years ago. Um, the Congressional Budget Office, for instance, has figures uh, showing that, uh, that the bottom fifth of, of Americans are something like 25 to 40 percent uh, better off today than, uh, than in 1979. How does that compare to the top 1% or the one-tenth right. of 1% that we hear about so much? Yeah, so the top 1%, uh, for instance, has, uh, has something like uh, tripled its, its income over that same period. So, uh, so the, the income growth that the middle class or that the poor have experienced um, over the last 35 years uh, is, is disappointing, certainly, compared to what's happened at the top. Inequality, the amount that we pay CEOs versus the amount that we pay fast food workers, is kind of one decision we make as a society how difficult it is for the daughter of a fast food worker to become a CEO uh, is a different set of, of decisions and policies that, uh, that we as a society uh, have to come to agreement on. Part of getting that equal shot, how the daughter of a fast food worker gets a shot to become a CEO is the education system, right? And um, the folks in the inequality camp will say, look, look at how drastic the different outcomes are from some of our school districts in our poorest neighborhoods in America versus the suburbs that might be doing better. Mm. Well, that's certainly true. And I think uh, work by Raj Chetty, who's a Harvard economist uh, on uh, mobility and neighborhoods, has really highlighted that uh, growing up around other poor neighbors really is a handicap on your mobility uh, as a child yourself. Um, and so that has real uh, interesting policy implications. You could uh, restructure uh, public housing programs where you gave families vouchers and in fact required them to move to uh, certain uh, neighborhoods that were not low income neighborhoods. And if you did that, Chetty's research uh, shows that, that odds are good you would have a real uh, impact on, on kids earnings when they, when they grow up. Uh, so again, it's not that income isn't important at, at all, but again, uh, there, there are differences uh, between low income and higher income communities that aren't just about income. Um, there's differences in values, there's difference in skills. Uh, so I think, I think where we've gone wrong in the last few years is in focusing so much on inequality uh, and, and making it sound like fixing these problems is actually as easy as, as redistributing money. So how do you tackle the problem of immobility? What are, what are the pr proposed solutions? That you First, I think we do need to, uh, to figure out how to improve the early childhood outcomes of kids um, and to help parents who want their kids to succeed uh, to help them to do that. And so I proposed a uh, $20 million a year office of opportunity uh, in the White House that essentially would fund a range of experiments across the country at the local level uh, and evaluate them rigorously to uh, to learn uh, what what succeeds and what doesn't. Uh, and by the way, uh, when we find out that things don't, uh, to, to cut them uh, ruthlessly. Um, but hopefully find uh, the models that do work. Uh, so there's a program in San Francisco called Ready for K uh, that text messages parents uh, tips on uh, reading to their kids while their kids are in the tub, things like that. Uh, and it's had remarkable results. I also think that uh, we need to continue reforming our safety net programs, which I do think uh, embed a lot of perverse incentives uh, that do impede uh, upward mobility. Uh, so there are work disincentives in some of these programs. There are marriage disincentives. There are disincentives for savings. Uh, and finally, I do propose um, trying to promote uh, more marriage um, and more planned uh, and intended childbearing. Uh, essentially by creating financial incentives through the tax code uh, to delay uh, having kids until you're married to somebody that uh, is going to be a stable relationship. 
I, I do think the increase in, in uh, out of wedlock births in the United States is, is a real problem for opportunity. So what happens? I mean, ha you know, those are the, the last point. I mean, that uh, for a lot of people are going to say, wait, look, that's sometimes not uh, something that a, a woman or a man can control, whether there's a divorce, whether there's mm -hmm. domestic violence, whether sure. in some communities there's incarceration, right? Yep. The reasons that someone ends up a single parent are not usually planned. Right, and I'm certainly sympathetic to that. I'm a single parent myself, actually. There are a lot of kids today who would do better uh, if they had been born into, uh, into more stable situations. Um, and, and I think, ultimately, if we could, uh, if we could reverse some of the trends in, uh, in single parenthood uh, that we've seen over the last few decades, the benefits would, would far outweigh the cost. And what about the earned income tax credit? Yes, I uh, am a big fan of the earned income, earned income tax credit. Um, part of why welfare reform in the 1990s was successful is not only did we make it harder to receive benefits and not work, we actually uh, made it easier to work because uh, if you're a low-income worker and uh, and you are working, you essentially get your earnings topped off by this earned income tax credit, and that really was a strong incentive to get people uh, to go into the workforce. Uh, to make work pay was the expression of the day. So I propose uh, in in my agenda greatly expanding uh, the earned in income tax credit. What's the most important thing you've heard a 2016 candidate say about poverty-related issues? Well, I think the turn uh, among uh, Republicans these days um, to really focus on uh, mobility and opportunity has been really useful. I think you've seen that in, uh, in Governor Bush's uh, right to rise rhetoric. Uh, you've seen it in, uh, in Senator Rubio's uh, remarks as well. Um, and I think the consensus on the right, which wasn't there as recently as four years ago, I think, um, that, that we do have an equality of opportunity in the United States and we really do need an agenda that will, that will really combat that rather than just sort of rhetoric uh, that, that sounds good. I think that's been the most exciting development of the campaigns. All right, Scott Winship, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.